Tonight, Hockey Canada's new defense in the face of mounting pressure for resignations at the top. Suggesting that toxic behavior is somehow a specific hockey problem is, in my opinion, counterproductive. The growing calls for change amid sex assault allegations rocking the sport. The promise of hundreds of millions of dollars to help Atlantic Canada rebuild. But what does that mean for people who need help right now? You want to go home. You just want to go home. And we bring together employees and employers as a perfect storm hits the Canadian workplace. Can't find workers, can't find employees. We as a workforce feel disrespected. So where have all the workers gone? This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for being with us. Hockey Canada is pushing back hard tonight against calls for a wave of resignations tied to its handling of sexual assault claims. Its current and former board chairs were put on the defensive, grilled by MPs at a House of Commons committee today. And some of the answers stunned the room. Hockey Canada has been under the microscope for months now over how it reacted to allegations of group sexual assaults involving players. But the calls for change are getting louder tonight. Ashley Burke now with the response. Canada's sport minister came out swinging this week against Hockey Canada. And what I'm expecting is for uh, executive management uh, resignation at this point. That set the stage for a combative hearing. The new interim chair of the board of directors, defiant, describing Hockey Canada as the victim. Our board, frankly, does not share the view that senior leadership should be replaced on the basis of what we consider to be substantial misinformation and, and unduly cynical attacks. It's a whole new line of defense that went even further. Suggesting that toxic behavior is somehow a specific hockey problem or to scapegoat hockey as a centerpiece for toxic culture is, in my opinion, counterproductive. CBC News, the fifth estate, identified 15 cases that police investigated of alleged group sexual assault by hockey players over the past three decades. In total, 50 players were accused, only one convicted of a lesser charge. Hockey Canada has also come under fire for using a fund in part made up of players' registration fees to compensate sexual assault complainants. Why? is the leader of this organization being protected rather than being held accountable. The, the leader is not being protected. Andrea Skinner says if leadership resigns, there could be consequences. Will the light stay on on the rink? I don't know. We can't, we can't, we can't predict that. And to me, that's not a, a risk worth taking. She went on to defend the current president, Scott Smith. What grade from an A to an F would you give him in his role at Hockey Canada right now? I would say that he's conducting himself as an A in the circumstances. MPs called it all tone deaf. I'd have to give them an F on this one. It's a, it's a failure, it's an F. Uh, Mr. Smith has not done what is necessary to change the culture within Hockey Canada. The sport minister now says she's lost hope that Hockey Canada will change on its own. I'm calling for uh, the 13 voting members to impose that change at Hockey Canada. The minister says she already used her strongest sanction when she froze Hockey Canada's federal funding this summer, but that these provincial and territorial organizations like BC Hockey, the Ontario Hockey Federation, they have voting power and can demand change from Hockey Canada. And Ashley, I gather the minister also announced one other measure today. She did, Adrian. She agreed to the NDP's request for a third party to conduct a financial audit into claims of lavish spending by the board of directors, including on dinners, hotel stays and championship rings. And it was confirmed today that, for example, if a national team won a championship, board members could get rings worth $3,000 each. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa, thank you. Now to Atlantic Canada, where the work continues to restore power to more than 15,000 customers who've been in the dark since Fiona hit. And tonight, a new promise from the federal government to help communities across the region rebuild. The announcement today, $300 million to help in the recovery to restore critical infrastructure and pay for damage not covered by insurance. The plan is to roll out that money over the next two years. Kayla Hounsel spoke to people who lost homes and businesses and need help right now. When you look at this picture, it's clear help is needed. So much help. We're still paying our mortgage. We're paying a mortgage on a house that's no longer there. 
Amy Osmond was home with her daughter when Fiona crashed ashore in Port Basque, Newfoundland. We gotta go. We gotta go. Her home now just a pile of rubble. We have the letter from insurance, the, the letter of denial. They will not cover it because it is an act of God. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau didn't offer any specifics in terms of how people can apply or when the money will roll out, but says the $300 million fund will assist anyone not covered by other programs. We will be there uh, to help with people who uh, are uninsured or underinsured for the kinds of damages that they've gone through. The money is going to be rolling out very quickly because we recognize that there are serious needs on the ground. Osmond says she's grateful, but offers a reality check. As that's Hober, you can't. You can't build anywhere in Newfoundland in the winter months. <laughs> it, it's just impossible. I don't know where where they would develop. There's a few spots in town, but I mean, there's so many families who have lost their homes. Trudeau says business owners will also be eligible. Yeah, that's where our building sat. And now here's where it sits. Barbara Deron runs an antique shop on Prince Edward Island. At least she did. She's now dealing with about $15,000 in damage. The water reached right up to the ceiling, actually spraying in there, and everything just swirled all around. She says she'll apply for help through the new fund. Osmond is hoping to rebuild eventually, but no amount of money can make that happen right now. Everybody gets that. We get that. But it's still, it's still hard because what do you want more than anything? You want to go home. You just want to go home. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News. Halifax. That's some of the fallout from Fiona now to the aftermath of Hurricane Ian and the growing death toll in the U.S. When you lose a loved one, there's just no words that can describe how we feel for that family. A terrible update from Florida's Lee County. The sheriff confirmed 55 deaths there alone and officials warn more victims could still be found. There are reports tonight that the overall death toll could be more than 100. U.S. President Joe Biden is expected to tour the damage in Florida tomorrow. Now to Russia's war on Ukraine. The Kremlin says it has now mobilized more than 200,000 reservists to join the fight. But before most can reach the front lines, those lines are shifting. Ukraine is advancing on multiple fronts. Ukrainian forces continue to push further east in the Donbass. Victory is both sweet and by some accounts sobering because there's a lot of death there. Ukraine is also making crucial gains in the south. Russia's grip on parts of the economically vital Kherson region is slipping. All of this less than a week after Russia claimed these territories. But as Breyer Stewart reports from Kyiv, speeches in Moscow don't matter much on the battlefields of Ukraine. For Russia, they're now unforgiving and a warning. Seeing those battlefields can be disturbing. Slow, village by village, Ukrainian troops hoist flags in the Kherson region in the country south. Just last week, Russia laid claim to this area, and now Ukraine is destroying any signs that its soldiers were here. This is a historic moment, says this Ukrainian soldier. Ukraine says Russian troops in Kherson are retreating south and east towards the Dnieper River, destroying bridges and ammunition stockpiles as they go. Even pro-Kremlin social media channels are talking about the land Russian forces are losing. In the northeast of the country, Liman is another city that Russia insists belongs to them. But Russian equipment is now abandoned in the forest, and even the bodies of its soldiers lie on the road. Ukrainian flags may be up, but it's hard to celebrate still surrounded by the ruins of war. The shelling was so intense that everything was shaking, says this woman. When the Ukrainian military arrived, they brought much-needed supplies to those who've spent months in their basements. We are going to win. Ukraine is buoyed by the momentum from battlefield wins, but Russia is quick to remind that it still has its nuclear weapons. Of course, the possibility of these nuclear strikes are discussed on a daily basis, you know. Yuri Sak is an advisor well, to Ukraine's defense minister and says Russia's nuclear warnings increase as its troops fall back. Russia is looking for a possible way to, you know, to 
compensate for, for this humiliation, to stop the Ukrainian counteroffensive. And uh, of course, they understand that to achieve this, they need to scare the world into believing that a nuclear strike is possible. But Ukraine says those threats haven't changed its strategy. In fact, today, President Volodymyr Zelensky signed a decree forbidding Ukraine from negotiating with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Kiev. And in North Korea, they're more than just threatening to launch missiles. They are doing it. This morning, people in Japan were told to shelter as a North Korean missile shot overhead. As Sasha Petrosik tells us, this time it landed in the ocean, but it's the next time that has people concerned. Sirens wailed, trains stopped, and people ducked underground as the North Korean missile streaked high above Japan. Prime Minister Kishida Fumio was furious. These repeated missile launches are outrageous, he says. There has been a flurry of them in the past 10 days, 37 this year. Normally shot straight up to avoid neighboring airspace, this missile was fired east from North Korea, flying 4,600 kilometers across Japan and out into the Pacific. Farther than ever in North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's quest for nuclear power and world attention. We're taking this uh, very, very seriously, uh, for sure. And we have the White House signaled a new round of talks was needed. Talks broken off three years ago by Donald Trump in Hanoi. We remain prepared to engage in, ser in serious and sustained uh, diplomacy. But there's also been muscle flexing by the U.S. and its allies. Bombs dropped off South Korea just hours after the missile flew and a U.S. aircraft carrier visiting the region. Last week, North Korea's ambassador told the U.N. that Washington has to end military drills before they ignite a war. But Kim has made it clear his own buildup won't stop. And since Hanoi, I think what we've seen in North Korea is really a doubling down, a tripling down on the state nuclear forces, on nuclear modernization. Uh, and so I suspect North Korea is unlikely now to move away from this trajectory. The best North Korea's opponents can do, say experts, is to try to contain it militarily. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Tonight marks a thousand days since Iran shot down Ukrainian International Airlines Flight 752, killing the 176 people on board. Most of those people had ties to Canada. Today, protesters in Ottawa made it clear they don't think the government is doing enough against the Iranian regime. But you are supporting the Islamic brutal regime in Iran. What we need is just a war. What we need is action. Some protesters are calling for the government to declare the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps a terrorist organization. Iran admitted the IRGC blew the airliner out of the skies over Tehran in 2020, it says, due to a mistake. In a statement today, the prime minister said the Iranian regime will be held accountable. This is the National Day of Action for missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and gender diverse people. As Cameron McIntosh shows us, amidst the calls for action, are families still searching for answers? Donna Bartlett isn't giving up. This was in December of 21, eh? Last picture I got of her. Her granddaughter, Mercedes, had been living on the streets, struggling with drugs. She hasn't been seen since March. We're putting up posters now all over. While we're driving around, we're seeing people, and some people tell us they know her, but they haven't seen her around, and... Nobody's seen her for a long time. Another Indigenous woman missing in a city where the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls came to national prominence with the death of Tina Fontaine eight years ago. Today, prayers not far from the river where Fontaine's body was found, one of dozens of ceremonies and vigils held across the country. In Toronto, a small demonstration in advance of a vigil. Today is a day about um, bringing community together to heal. Three years ago, the inquiry into murdered and missing women and girls found the violence these groups face amounted to genocide and ended up making 231 wide-ranging calls for justice, changes to legislation, social and health supports, and law enforcement. Hey. At a vigil on Parliament Hill, criticisms the federal government is moving too slowly 
Senator Michelle Odette was an inquiry commissioner. This national inquiry, they order it. Now, what is the response? What we've seen are results that are, that are far too slow. Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller says the government has invested over a billion dollars in supports, including housing, but concedes more urgency is needed. I don't think anyone should be happy until every woman, child and, and, and vulnerable person in this country is, uh, is safe and free from, uh, free from violence. Meanwhile, Donna Bartlett is just trying to get some answers. It's scary. We just want to find her alive. Keeping the pressure on police, the community and anyone who will listen. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. New numbers confirm what a lot of parents already knew. Kids were less physically active during the pandemic as their screen time soared. But interestingly, there is some good news in this. So while the structured stuff disappeared, we learned again that we can play outside. We can use green spaces. We can find the trails that exist. Trail use went way up. And so participation recommends more of that. Go play outside even as more structured activities like gym class or play dates come back into our lives. And by the way, the rise in screen time is so sharp, the report card gives kids an F in that category. There are calls tonight for parents to resist the urge to stock up on medications for kids' fevers. There were shortages earlier this year, and as a new season of sniffles approaches, Christine Birak shows us what doctors and pharmacists say you can do instead of hoarding. Knowing pharmacy shelves might be bare, some parents are turning online, where the search for kids' cold and flu meds is feverish. Filled with posts on where to find children's Tylenol or Advil, accusations of hoarding, and pleas for help to spare a bottle for a sick child. So instead of having it shipped from the States, we had it shipped from Alberta. Jenna Lee Gordon is a mom of three, including little AJ. I'm like, what if he gets sick and we don't have anything to help relieve that? So it was very, very scary, very worrisome for me and my family. We need to always remember that the vast, vast majority of fevers in young immunized children who are previously healthy are caused by viruses and they'll go away on their own. Dr. Sarah Reed deals with pediatric emergencies. As cold, flu and COVID cases rise, she says demand for fever meds will too. I would hope that parents don't panic, that there are things available to help their child to be more comfortable. Generally, you can go talk to your pharmacist and they will help you find a solution. So give me a sense of what a pharmacist would do. Pharmacy professor Mina Tadro says everyday pain and fever meds can be made in a pharmacy. So this is a powder, right? Yeah, this is a powder. The active ingredient is acetaminophen. Make sure that it's pretty consistent. Grind it out, add the liquid little by little. Tadru says the mixture can be refrigerated for two weeks, but insists don't ask for it or buy bottles off the shelves unless your child is sick. By you taking 20 off, the shelf is empty, that pharmacy has to order it, someone comes in and the hysteria continues. Gordon's order arrived as a two-pack. I definitely want to leave some for other parents. She hopes her kids won't need it and offer to share her bottles online for free. So, Christine, this is a bit tricky. I hear the appeal, don't hoard the medicine, but also there are parents saying, wait a minute, you know, what if my little one actually needs it? Absolutely. Fevers can be scary for parents, but chances are you don't need these medications. You heard Dr. Reed say they will help children feel more comfortable, which makes this easier on everyone. But if fever is your immune system working, it's raising your body's temperature to fight a virus, and it usually takes up to five days. What doctors do say is while your child is sick, monitor them. If their fever goes above 40, they're not taking in liquids, it's difficult to wake them up, go see a doctor. And this is even more important for infants who are under three months old. If they have any kind of fever or their temperature seems off, go see a doctor. Something is causing that. Okay, but don't panic about this. Absolutely not. All right, Christine Birak, thank you. You're welcome. European lawmakers have made a move that could save consumers money and a whole lot of aggravation. We are replacing this pile of chargers with just this. Coming up, why charger changes could be coming to Canada too. Next. Labor shortages have transformed the job market the world over. They're asking me to do seven more jobs just to make that same money. You don't want to hear what he just said there. We need to make our industry attractive again. So we have a frank conversation about the future of work with employees and employers. And a little later, when I was born 
to call Miner's daughter. Saying goodbye to a country music legend. We were poor, but we had love. How Loretta Lynn gave voice to her humble roots. We're back in two. The National, voted Canada's best national newscast. Elon Musk has made an about face on his plans to buy, then not buy Twitter. He's now offering to go through with a purchase at the originally agreed upon price of $44 billion U.S. He first struck the deal in April, but then tried to back out of it. Twitter was taking him to court for that. Now, after receiving his letter today, Twitter says it intends to close this transaction. In a landmark ruling, the EU is decreeing that all smartphones must use the same charging port. For an appliance so universal, the simple act of plugging them in is not. As Anise Haidari shows us, this finally creates one wire to rule them all, and maybe not just in Europe. Vote is closed, and it is adopted. The European Parliament has voted to put the U in USB. U as in universal. We are replacing this pile of chargers with just this. Devices like laptops and phones in the EU will have to use the same sort of charging port and cable. It's called USB-C, already used on newer Android phones. Apple didn't want this. iPhones use a different kind of cable, the lightning cord. That'll have to change. But many Apple customers seem to shrug this off. They got rid of the like headphone jack uh, but then uh, they have adapters, so it's like, who's winning? If we have less specific use case cables, then we can use the same cable for multiple things, therefore creating less waste to begin with. I think they will go along. I don't think it's something worth fighting. They have the lightning cable for so many years anyway. There's no sign of similar legislation in Canada, but you can still expect these newer ports and cables in your area code. It's going to happen in Europe first, obviously, but it's going to trickle down to the entire world. Experts say it doesn't make financial sense for Apple to have one set of devices just for Europe. It's time to go beyond. That means iPhone lovers in Canada need to get ready. There's a lot of people that own iPhones and have tons of lightning cables sitting around. Like I myself, I have a ton, right? Um, I'm going to have to buy a couple USB-C cables, so there'll be that switch. But then you can also make the argument that like every Android device already uses USB-C. Apple's the only holdout. This isn't totally new for Apple. Without any regulation, some MacBooks and iPads have already made this exact switch. And the old cables won't be illegal, so you can still hang on to these. Anise Hidari, CBC News, Calgary. In Vancouver, police are asking for the public's help to find two suspects wanted for smashing a piece of Olympic history. This is new surveillance video just released from early Saturday morning. Investigators say one person approached the city's 2010 Olympic cauldron with a tool, while the other appeared to pull out a camera to record the destruction. Authorities say they deliberately caused thousands of dollars in damage. Now, whether you're an employee or employer, ongoing labor shortages have turned the job market entirely upside down. As owners, we were even taking shifts as dishwashers. That burnout from being asked to work extra hours and extra days. Coming up, we're trying to make sense of a once-in-a-generation crisis. Plus, lost Canadians, the fight to regain citizenship for those who already had it. There is an unprecedented labor shortage in this country. You can see it in the help wanted signs, the service delays, even emergency room closures. And some experts say this could drag on for a decade, which begs the question, where did all the workers go? In a search for answers, we brought together employers struggling to fill jobs and employees who've walked away from some. What emerged from that conversation was a picture of a perfect storm. Trevor, this is your restaurant. I know you need staff. I've been watching you, you know, work the phones, trying to get them even this morning. We've posted two jobs in the last four weeks for three locations, one of which is here. We had 150, 160 applicants. Mm -hmm. uh, for cooks, the first week, we confirmed 18 interviews. Uh, one showed up. 
Oof. We hired that one person. Of course. She quit after two, two shifts. Where's so, she? And we don't know where she went. So it's the, it's the where did they go question. Yeah, where did they go and are they coming back? <laughs> right. So that, that is the thing that we're trying to tackle because, you know, as, as we all know, the statistics are pretty eye-popping. You know, we're in, we're in a period of sort of record vacancies for jobs. Rose, you run a construction company. Yeah. Um, can't find workers, obviously can't find employees. Um, you know, we had an ad out um, for admin assistant and uh, bookkeeping and uh, three, four interviews didn't show up. I hired two, three people, didn't show up. No text, no phone call. But what happens with our, you know, our long-term employees, they end up working overtime or they get, they get more put on their plate and, you know, they get stressed out. So then you're caught in this web where, like, the reward for loyalty for your employees, the ones who are loyal, is that they get worked harder and harder and harder. Right. So I, I, I see Lindsay here yeah. nodding like this. You, you were a nurse at SickKids. Uh, does that ring true to you? That burnout from being asked to work extra hours and extra days and more, 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 and the guilt that comes with it and having my vacations denied. My loyalty was to there. I had spent most of my career working there, and the reward was work harder with less, work harder with less. So you left? I left. I actually just didn't work for a few months because I literally couldn't. I didn't have, I got to a point where I didn't have one more shift in me. I have at this point, no intention of going back to the bedside. We now have a culture where we can work from home more. That's hurt the mindset of going into work, or especially if you come from an industry where it's physically arduous. I think the money is not the issue anymore. So everybody, in a way, is talking about you, right? <laughs> so, Jay, you left, right? You, you were a really good employee with a tech company and you said I'm done. If we were always obviously understaffed like everybody else was. We were always overworked, right? Um, but the, the, the game changer part was where like COVID hit. The way we used to work changed a lot. And I was eventually at a point, you know what? I don't have to do this. So what are you doing now? So I actually, um, part-time just because when I was in between jobs looking for something, I was driving for Uber. And then I did get a job with a company for as an insurance advisor. I don't even have to leave my house for it. It's a better job with a better salary, more job security. You don't want to hear what he just said there. Like that, that's got to hurt because you consider the food industry, right? I, I definitely did. But then again, don't get me wrong, but would you want to do it where you'd have to go out there, stand on your feet all day long, as you mentioned before, and um, probably understaffed every, like every other place. My answer to that is that there are good operators out there who are willing to listen to employees if they're ready to have the discussion. We can't even get to the table to talk to people. Yeah. This is why Armin is here because Armin, you know, as an economist, as someone who studies like the future of workers, these four anecdotal experiences, I'm guessing they, they all ring true to you. 100%. So the labor market is actually growing more people are working and doing more things. Uh, but. The other thing that has happened is almost 600,000 people have crossed that line from under the age of 65 to over the age of 65, and there's fewer people, about 13,000 fewer people in the ages 15 to 24. So we've got more exits from the labor market than coming into the labor market. The challenge for us is we don't see a pipeline, right? And we think that, so I think as of this summer, we have 100, over 160,000 vacancies in food service across the country, which represents over 13% of our workforce. And not only is there no pipeline, but the whole world is going through this. We are in an international foot race to find enough workers. So you talk about this international foot race. Let's, can you just break down for us what's happening in the global north and the global south, just, just to make that very clear? Okay, well, let's look at this map. I mean, if you were to draw an imaginary line across the middle where the equator is, you would see that the colors in the north part are darker than in the south. Fast forward 20 years, 30 years, we've got one of the highest shares on the surface of the planet of the population who is 65 years of age and older. If it was just aging, if it was just that train coming at us, why does it feel so incredibly urgent right now? It's because we're in the middle of a perfect storm. So yeah, slowest train in the world coming at you, 
don't prepare for it. On top of that, introduce a pandemic that nobody saw coming that is upending our demand for health care as well as people getting sick and leaving the labor force. And the third factor is there's just so much pent up demand for housing, for so for construction, for finally going out and eating out, right? Like people have got money burning holes in their pockets and they want to go out and play and they need places to live and there's just not enough workers or supplies to actually make that happen in a timely way. When I was burned out and I was trying to f find a way to keep going because I didn't want to be where I was, right? I went to my employer and asked for time off. But we are so short staffed, they could not accommodate it. I drove home that night and, and put in my resignation. The problem is they're, they're asking me to do seven more jobs just to make that same money. Mm -hmm. But then later I realized that it was just uh, taking a toll on my health. Yeah. As an employer though, sometimes your hands are tied. You know, we bring up COVID. We didn't know. We all, you know, I thought, okay, let's go home for two weeks. When we come back, everything will be good and back to normal. And the construction industry didn't stop. It, it continued. We lost uh, some employees because they were at that, that point where, you know, 62, 63, I have to do what? You're making me do what? I, I don't need this. There are so many issues here that can be resolved with better preparation and making more of the people we've got. We look at labor shortages as uniquely a problem, and it is a problem. But it is also the pathway, it kind of gives you sight lines on what's the pathway to actually a better labor market where more people have got more of what they want. A living wage, time off that they need to take care of themselves, their loved ones, and to learn to upgrade their skills. Yet but while you wait for that, you know, Rose and Trevor, you're, you're in a position where you, you're triaging. What are some of the things, like really tangible micro things you're doing to hang on? As owners, we we're even taking shifts as dishwashers. Part of our service now is we actually don't even serve on regular dishware anywhere because we can't wash our dishes quick enough. Up? Offering to pay for interviews, <laughs> but you know, pay somebody to come and do offering to pay for their transportation to be here and for their time. So if they're here, you know, for an hour, you know, we're offering to pay for them to come for their interview. So th there's another part of this conversation that sometimes gets whispered, and it's a little bit nasty, right? Which is where people say. You know, they'll talk about the, the labor shortage and then someone will lean in and say, but the problem is people just don't want to work anymore, <laughs> right? You've heard it, right? They, they don't want to work, they don't want to work hard. How crazy does that make you? I had uh, about 16 people in my team. 12 of us left. Oof. We still talk. Hmm. And, we talk and everybody's working, nobody's jobless. <laughs> Somebody might be looking for a less physically draining work. Somebody might be looking for something that has more salary. Every single metric in statistics would say, people can't work anymore right now. That's why we're having a problem. Unemployment rates are at half century lows. Vacancy rates have never been this high in our history before since we started measuring them. We as a workforce feel disrespected. And I think that my generation, and maybe I'm wrong, my generation is not willing to be um, considered for, you know, we're not willing to settle, we're not willing to be considered for less than what we bring to the table. I know that for hospitality sector, we need to make our industry attractive again because no one wants to be in our industry. I, I grew up in a restaurant my dad opened with my grandfather as the chef. I love this industry deeply. Yeah. It's what I live for, but I love it a lot less. I agree, um, I feel the same. The passion, I have days now where I get up and I want to tap out. I, I actually, don't want to do it anymore, yeah, but but I don't have the option, don't have the option though, and right? I don't we know don't I don't option. know what else we don't. to do. Yeah. I also feel like there are people at home who see themselves in your experience, and and some who are maybe surprised by the depth of the emotion that is connected to this because it's a loss. Everybody is talking in in terms of grief in one way or another. Hmm. So I, I want to thank all of you for taking time with us. So clearly there are a lot of layers to all this and we're going to be covering this labor crisis for weeks to come. As part of that, we want to hear your stories, your struggles, your solutions, critically, your solutions. Get in touch through Instagram or by email, thenational at cbc.ca. Up next, how a missed deadline could cost some people in this country their Canadian citizenship. They said, no, actually, you have 30 days to leave the country. 
the fight to make changes to Canada's Citizenship Act, and a little later. I wish that I could fly away to a land beyond this pain. Now, remembering a coal miner's daughter, the life and times of Loretta Lynn. With Parliament back, there's growing hope that a long-standing issue with Canada's Citizenship Act could soon be fixed. It has to do with a pretty confusing section that's left some people who had citizenship suddenly facing deportation. Karen Pauls explains the problem and why critics say even more needs to be done to help others. Pete Giesbrecht has lived in Manitoba most of his life. He's voted, paid taxes, and had a Canadian passport. But in 2015, he was summoned to the local police station and told he was going to be deported. They said, no, actually, you have 30 days to, to leave the country. And if you do not leave willingly, we will fly you out uh, with bracelets and all. Giesbrecht is a landscaper now, but back then he was a commercial truck driver, crossing the Manitoba-U.S. border more than 100 times a year. He even had a card certifying he'd been pre-cleared to use special customs lanes. And you never had a problem at the border? Never, not one time. Confused? You're not the only one. This case is known as the Age 28 Rule. Ever since 1977, second-generation Canadians born abroad have had an automatic right to citizenship, but they had to meet certain conditions and they had to apply to retain it before they turned 28. They automatically and unknowingly lost status if they missed that deadline. I am simply asking the government to fulfill the promises that they have given to us. In 2009, the federal government tried to fix that, but those amendments created even more problems. The government only corrected it for those people who had not yet turned 28 years of age. If you'd already lost your citizenship, you were out. New legislation coming before Parliament is meant to naturalize people like Giesbrecht, who fell into that crack. Bill S-245 has already been passed by the Senate. There are thousands of people, actually many thousands of people in Canada, that are affected and might still not know it, and this will make it so they are whole, that, as though they never lost their citizenship. But there is another category of lost Canadians this bill won't help, even if it is passed. The storm moves this way, so boom, boom. In Nagoya, Japan, Victoria Maruyama is fighting to have Canada recognize her children as citizens. She is Canadian, was raised in Alberta, went to UBC. But because she and her children were born outside of Canada, her kids don't automatically become Canadians. This is called the second generation cutoff rule. The shock of it, like, oh my God, I am not Canadian enough. That was, that was a shock. The children have lived in Canada for a total of three years. Maruyama has applied for citizenship and immigration for them, but they've been rejected because Ottawa said they couldn't prove a substantial connection to Canada. Like grandparents, like, helped build the stupid railroad. It's, it makes me really angry. She wants to move home. And that's where our family is, and we, we want to go back. Like, I have to go back. My, my mom's not getting any younger, and neither is my, my stepdad, so... We're going to need to be there. Maruyama and six other families are part of a constitutional challenge filed by Toronto lawyer Sujit Chowdhury. What's discriminatory about the Citizenship Act is that there is no way uh, that people can rid themselves of this second class status, uh, no matter how um, close and deep their ties to Canada are. This law creates hierarchies of Canadians uh, based on where they were born. I was told that I would never forget that date, and boy, was he right. As for Pete Giesbrecht, on October 17, 2017, he received his Canadian citizenship for a second time. It means security. It means a future. It means a hope for the children in a, in a place that we are, we are free. If Parliament is finally able to overturn all of the age 28 rule this session, there is hope that they'll be able to tackle the second generation cutoff rule next. 
Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Coming up next, the world of country music has lost a legendary voice. Well, I was born to call miners' daughter. How Loretta Lynn is being remembered tonight. Plus, in the aftermath of Fiona, many are still without power. But in our moment, we'll introduce you to one man more than making the most of it. Some fond memories tonight of Loretta Lynn and the classic country hits that made her a beloved star. She passed away at the age of 90, but her legacy lives on in the song she wrote about hard times and cheating husbands. She sang about her humble roots, too, as a coal miner's daughter, but as one journalist noted today, she sparkled like a diamond, brilliant, unbreakable, and resplendent. Lisa Shing shows us why some female country stars are thanking her tonight. Beloved and celebrated for decades, Loretta Lynn was called the Queen of Country. Yes, I wish that I could fly away. She was known for a repertoire of songs that told the story of her life, depicted most famously in this song about growing up poor in the Appalachian Mountains. Well, I was born to call miners' daughter. Her best-selling memoir, Coal Miner's Daughter, became a hit movie. Sissy Spacek won an Oscar for depicting Lynn's spirit and talent. When you think of her, you think of her ability to just speak to the experiences of often underrepresented voices, young moms, um, poor women with so much tenacity, so much color, so much vibrance. Lynn wrote songs about love and sex with an everyday honesty. Don't come home or drink up with love on your mind. And birth control. Yeah, make it up for all those years since I've got the pill. She's paved the path for so many women in country music. And I think that's so important as artists and writers to take that, share our own truths and share our own stories so we can connect and relate to people. Over her five decade career, Lynn became the first woman named Country Music Association Entertainer of the Year and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. I had to live my songs to write them and I think, it, I think it's everyday living. She released more than 60 albums and collaborated with musicians like Jack White and Katie Lang. In reaction to her death, Katie Lang tweeted, Joyous, fierce, one of a kind. I loved meeting and working with Loretta Lynn. Dolly Parton said, She was a wonderful human being, wonderful Stay talent, had millions of fans, and I'm going. one of them. Stay with me if you can. A Stay testament to the kind of legacy she leaves behind. Long. Lisa Shing, Ain't CBC no News, Toronto. To go. And that line, I have to live those songs to write them. All right, finally, tonight, we want to take you back to Nova Scotia, where one man is taking resilience to a whole new level. Brian Pace is from Ecomseekum on the eastern shore. He is one of the many in that province who has been without power since Fiona hit. A gourmet meal and a soak in the tub, all thanks to some pretty remarkable ingenuity. Tonight, his can-do attitude is our moment. Roasting. Day 10 without power, but it's been fantastic. Look at this view. This all started um, because, of course, I wanted hot food. I wanted uh, real food. And I'm just roasting a, a cauliflower here. I just turned it over so, to brown it in my little oven. I need a cooked food after just eating uh, cheese crackers sandwiches. And I thought, well, I'm burning. Why can't I cook? Are you having people for lunch even today? Yes, we're going to sample the food that we're making. Well, whatever he does is delicious. I went this morning and picked flowers and they're soaking in the tub where I fill this up with water, which is a mixture of salt and fresh water and the sun heats it and I can actually have a bath. When I'm soaking in the tub, I like to have a glass of wine at the end of the day. <laughs> You're making the best out of a storm ever. <laughs> it's fun, but I'm ready to have power. Yeah. No kidding. Trust Colleen Jones to find Brian, by the way, uh, pretty humbled by his skills and also that attitude. That is a national for October the 4th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.